Hello everyone, we are so glad that you're here. My name is Kate Budries and I'm the branch manager for the Glenn McNary branch of the Greensboro Public Library. And on behalf of the Greensboro Public Library Foundation uh, and the Greensboro Public Library, welcome to tonight's program. Thank you to those of you in the audience who contribute to the foundation. It is through your support that we can offer quality programming like this. In partnership with the community, the Greensboro Public Library strives to provide free and equal access to information foster lifelong learning, and inspire the joys of reading. We connect and collect. The Greensboro Public Library is your conduit to so many resources. If you don't have a library card, you can stop by your local branch to get one. They're free. You can visit www.greensboropubliclibrary, or sorry, .greensborolibrary.org. Again, that's www.greensborolibrary.org to find a branch near you. Did you know that we have several library databases related to health and medical information? You can browse journals and magazines through the Consumer Health Database, the Health and Medical Collection, and the Public Health Database. You can visit Medline Plus for information about medical conditions, treatments, and healthy lifestyles. And for North Carolina specific information, you can peruse the NC Health Info Database. To learn more, please contact your neighborhood branch or visit the Greensboro Public Library website. Please be aware that this program is being recorded and may be shared on the Greensboro Public Library's social media channels, including YouTube. If you do not wish to be recorded, you are welcome to turn off your camera and or edit your name as it is displayed in Zoom. Recordings may be edited for length. Please note that recordings and related chat messages are public records subject to North Carolina's public records law and may be disclosed to third parties. So some quick housekeeping items before we begin. To avoid any ambient noise or feedback, we ask that you remain muted during this program unless specifically prompted to turn on your microphones. If you have any questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat and we'll try to answer as many as we can during that Q&A portion at the end of this session. And thank you all again for being here. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Cheryl Greenberg. Thank you, Kate. Um, a little administrative question. Kate, for you, if folks want to, if, if since we have a small group here, here today, more people will see this as a recording, I'm sure. Um, can people write into the chat or open their mics and speak? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to be sure. Yeah. Thank you. So welcome Just make everybody. sure that you, um, if you are turning off your mic to speak during the chat, make sure you mute yourself again when you're done, just so that we can kind of avoid some of that ambient noise. Thanks. and having multiple mics on at once. Okay, well, thank you all for being patient during the housekeeping question. I'm Cheryl Greenberg, I'm Dr. Cheryl Greenberg, and I am a life coach for seniors and their families. Uh, when those folks are making a transition in their life of some kind. Sometimes folks wanna talk about an exciting new change. They wanna retire, they wanna downsize, they want to take a trip around the world. They need some help making those decisions not the specific plan, but, you know, finding out whether this is right for them. In most, in many cases, folks uh, talk with me because some of the family is navigating an illness, uh, such as a dementia, and they need to understand that better and figure out how to deal with that kind of, of situation. I would say that today, almost uh, all of my work in the last 15 months has been centered around this very issue of socializing. It's an incredibly important issue, so I'm pleased to talk about it today, but it's particularly important because for the last 15 months, our socializing has been really curtailed, and lots of people have had questions about what they're going to do next. And I happen to know some of the people who are here, so I know you all have great ideas, but we'll try and build on those today. Just uh, to get our minds sort of around the topic, to sort of focus, I want to ask you some questions. And you can um, just think about this for yourself. We don't really need to stop and talk about them yet. But how many times typically, how many times a week, do you participate in activities with other people? What's your favorite activity with other people? 
And really importantly, and this is what we're going to talk about today, what are some of the challenges of taking part in social activities? I want to, I'm betting that when you thought about something you do with other people, you smiled. Maybe you didn't smile as much when you thought about the challenges. I do want to talk today not just about what we can do, but I want to start with the why, because socializing is incredibly important. So we're going to talk about who, what, where, when we can socialize, some new ideas, even ideas about um, socializing from a distance rather than face to face. But right now, let's start with the why. Why is it important? So when you socialize, you may notice that smile. You may notice that you just feel good. You feel better. Even introverts, people who feel like they can't be with other people for long periods of time, still have a need to, to have face-to-face -face contact or at the very least virtual contact with other people on some kind of regular basis, even if it's for less time than somebody who's more gregarious. You just notice when you socialize that you feel good, but what's that all about? Well, it's a very interesting circular kind of explanation. First of all, when we socialize, we reduce stress. Even if we don't notice that we're reducing stress, when it's measured in a laboratory, measured by scientists, we know that stress is reduced. People are less anxious and they're less depressed when they're not isolated, but rather when they are interacting with other people. Well, interestingly enough, they also feel, people feel better about themselves. It builds their self-esteem. You know, if somebody wants to spend time with you and listen to what you have to say, it makes you sort of puff out your chest and say, hey, that's pretty terrific. Somebody likes me. Somebody cares about what I have to say. And so we get a sense of well-being, a sense that things are going a little better in our world when we socialize. Now, all of the things I just said, reducing stress, less anxiety and depression, feeling a sense of well-being, all are sort of mind states, emotional states. But, did you, but you may already know this, that actually they have physiological um, impacts on our body. When you reduce stress and you reduce depression and anxiety, for example, we reduce hormones that do damage to our brain, to our bodies, like cortisol. When we're unhappy, our body produces more negative impact hormones, and they actually physically um, reduce the function of the cells in our bodies and brain. The other side of the coin is when you feel pretty good about yourself, you increase the hormone, the positive, if you will, it's not actually what they're called, but those hormones that have a positive effect on the health of our cells, they help us to, re to produce new cells, they help the cells clean themselves and repair themselves. So not only do we feel happier, whatever happiness means to you, but physically we're healthier, both in our um, well, I, in our bodies and brains, I know the brain is part of the body, but as I said last week, we sort of separate those out when we talk about health. So good for the body and good for the brain. The other thing that happens is that when we're feeling good and when we're socializing, we tend to be more fit. Why? Well, we, that happens actually because when you feel good about yourself, you're more likely to take care of yourself. You're more likely to eat better, to exercise more. You may even have a buddy you exercise with. It's all very, as I said, very circular. Overall, the issue here is that people who socialize, an adequate amount for them are healthier and actually live longer. So I wanted to introduce you to Susan Pinker. So if you would be patient with me, whoops, for just a minute, I have to, to unshare my screen and share something different. I'm going to stop the share for a second, and then I'm going to 
go back out here and see if we can listen to Susan Pinker for a while. Here's an intriguing fact. In the developed world, everywhere, women live an average of six to eight years longer than men do. Six to eight years longer. That's like a huge gap. In 2015, The Lancet published an article showing that men in rich countries are twice as likely to die as women are at any age. But there is one place in the world where men live as long as women. It's a remote mountainous zone, a blue zone where super longevity is common to both sexes. This is the blue zone in Sardinia, an Italian island in the Mediterranean between Corsica and uh, Tunisia, where there are six times as many centenarians as on the Italian mainland, less than 200 miles away. There are 10 times as many centenarians as there are in North America. It's the only place where men live as long as women. But why? My curiosity was piqued. I decided to research the science and the habits of the place. And I started with the genetic profile. I discovered soon enough that genes account for just 25% of their longevity. The other 75% is lifestyle. So what does it take to live to 100 or beyond? What are they doing right? What you're looking at is an aerial view of Villa Grande. It's a village at the epicenter of the blue zone uh, where I went to investigate this. And as you can see, architectural beauty is not its main virtue. Density is. Tightly spaced houses interwoven alleys and streets. It means that the villagers' lives constantly intersect. And as I walked through the village, I could feel hundreds of pairs of eyes watching me from behind doorways and curtains, from behind shutters. Because like all ancient villages, Villa Grande couldn't have survived without this structure, without its walls, without its cathedral, without its village square. Because defense and social cohesion defined its design. Urban priorities changed as we moved towards the Industrial Revolution because infectious disease became the risk of the day. But what about now? Now, social isolation is the public health risk of our time. Now, a third of the population says they have two or fewer people to lean on. But let's go to Villa Grande now as a contrast to meet some centenarians. Meet Giuseppe Marino, he's 102, a super centenarian and a lifelong resident of the village of Villa Grande. He was a gregarious man. He loved to recount stories, such as how he lived like a bird from what he could find on the forest floor during not one, but two world wars. How he and his wife, who also lived past 100, raised six children in a small, homey kitchen where I interviewed him. Here he is with his sons, Angelo and Domenico, both in their 70s and looking after their father, and who were, quite frankly, very suspicious of me and my daughter who came along with me on this trip. Because the flip side of social cohesion is a wariness of strangers and outsiders. But Theo Giuseppe, he wasn't, he wasn't suspicious at all. He was a happy-go-lucky guy, very um, outgoing, with a positive outlook. And I wondered, so is that what it takes to live to be 100 or beyond, thinking positively? Actually, no. <laughs> Meet Giovanni Correa, she's 101, the grumpiest person I have ever met. And he put a lie to the notion that you have to be positive to live a long life. And there is evidence. When I asked him why he lived so long, he kind of looked at me on the hooded eyelids and he growled, nobody has to know my secret. But despite being a sourpuss, the niece who lives with him and looks after him called him, give Tesoro my treasure. And she respected him and loved him. And she told me when I questioned this obvious loss of her freedom, you just don't understand, do you? Looking after this man is a pleasure. It's a huge privilege for me. This is my heritage. And indeed, wherever I went to interview these centenarians, I found a kitchen party. Here's Giovanni with his two nieces, Maria, above him and beside him, his great niece, Sarah, who's 
came when I was there to bring fresh fruits and vegetables. And I quickly discovered by being there that in the blue zone, as people age, and indeed across their lifespan, they're always surrounded by extended family, by friends, by neighbors, the priest, the barkeeper, the grocer. People are always there or dropping by. They are never left to live solitary lives. This is unlike the rest of the developed world, where as George Burns puts happiness is having a large, loving, caring family in another city. Now, so far, we've only met men, long-living men, but I met women too. And here you see Gia Teresa. She, at over 100, taught me how to make the local specialty, which is called Pularjonis, which are these large pasta pockets, like ravioli about this size, this size. And they're filled with high-fat ricotta and mint and drenched in tomato sauce. <laughs> and she showed me how to make just the right crimp so they wouldn't open. And she makes them with her daughter every Sunday and distributes them by the dozens to neighbors and friends. And that's when I discovered a low-fat, gluten-free diet is not what it takes to live to 100 in the blue zone. So what do you think about that? In fact, what she's, say, what she's saying is in the, this blue zone, and by the way, she, she indicated that this, this village in Sardinia was in a blue zone. There are a number of blue zones around the world that gerontologists are studying for the same reason that Susan Pinker is. Well, here's the thing. Susan Pinker and others who have studied this looked at the common wisdom about what keeps people healthy and um, healthy and uh, keeps and helps and living long. We, I always say, and I told you, I told the group this last week, that exercise is probably the first or second most important thing we can do in order to keep our bodies and brains healthy. There are lots of other things. I mean, clearly stopping smoking, moderating alcohol intake, um, getting vaccinated, all of those things are important. But Susan Pinker's making the, the statement that number one, most important, is socializing. That's a new thought for us. That's something that we really didn't know a lot about um, until very recently. And what does socializing look like according to Susan Pinker? Well, she talks about building your village. She talks about needing to have, and you can think about this for yourself, a three or more relationships according to her, and there's no magic about the numbers, but this is her recommendation or her finding, that people uh, to be socializing adequately to get this health and longevity um, bump as it were, in your life, you need to have three or more really close relationships. These are the people who, when um, it's snowing outside and you go outside, drop your car keys in a snow drift, these are the people who will put on their galoshes, walk to your house and help you find your car keys. These are the people that you tell your secrets to, who care about you, and about whom you care. Very close relationships, like um, like the treasure uncle, the uncle treasure, um, you know, niece and other family members. She also says that you need that we need to have more casual relationships, sort of a bigger circle, if you will. And it looks sort of like this. We want to start with three or four people in this inner circle. And then there have to be not just five, but lots and lots of other people who we know by name perhaps, or we don't. Um, people we go to class with, uh, if we go to Shepherd Center, for example, um, just in general, people we see from time to time, but we would not be reluctant to say, hey, how are you doing? They make us, they know, they help us to see that our world is populated. 
it is important when possible to see the people to see people face to face. For some reason, well, when we when we study the physiology of this, when we study how people's brains and bodies respond, we get better response when people are actually face to face when they touch, you know, a fist bump or a hug. Uh, those things make us even healthier. But in the absence of that, as we were in the last 15 months, getting on a Zoom call, making a regular telephone call still has a high impact. So think for just a second, and I will not ask you to answer this publicly, but think about who's in your circle of intimacy. Who do you talk to on a regular basis? And it doesn't have to be somebody who you're in love with. It can just be somebody you see every Wednesday afternoon or somebody you speak to once a week, a relative perhaps who you call um, and check in with every day or every month. What's something, who's somebody else you might want to bring into your circle? What kind of person would you like to see enter your circle? Okay, that's the background and a little bit of time for you to think. So how do you do it? Because that's the question, right? Actually, I gave you all the scientific background or a little bit of scientific background, but the fact of the matter is we sort of know we need to socialize. We sort of know that sitting by ourselves and not talking to people and watching TV and it just doesn't do it for us. But the problem is, how do we uh, increase our social activity? And so today, I want to talk now about who, what, where, and when. In other words, I'm going to talk about some ideas. Um, when I started thinking about this, some ideas came to me and then they grew and the pile got bigger and bigger. But they're still my ideas. And so I invite you to, to make a note of any idea that you'd like to try. But more likely, something I say will trigger something, an idea of your own. Write that down too. And at the end of this, um, at the end of our hour, I will, as, as I believe Kate said to you, we have a handout. And if you just email me, I'd be happy to send it to you so you don't have to write everything down I say. Or, um, there are the um, types of activities, because there's so many of them, I put into five different categories. Social and support groups, education and learning, teaching and giving, working and careers, volunteering and advocacy. No matter which category you think about, there are some uh, rules of the game, some things that make your socializing most effective, most satisfying. I call them the ABCs for new socializing activity. The A stands for activity. It is incredibly important that you be active. Sitting and watching, that you pick an activity literally an activity, not something passive. So if your next door neighbor comes over every Saturday night and you both sit in a lounge chair and watch a TV show, that's socializing, but not quite. It's doing something, it's interacting, it's communicating, it's talking with each other and sharing feelings, ideas, and um, projects and so forth. For an activity to really reach Susan Pinker's inner circle or even the outer circle, there also needs to be B for bonding. In other words, there has to be not just a, just a very remote kind of relationship with other people, but enough of a relationship that you would, you know you have something in common, you know you want to share, um, a greeting at the very least, and maybe some uh, some conversation that's substantive, whether it's a five minute conversation with the male person, or it's an hour conversation 
with a group of people who you see regularly once a month. I invite people to, to do C, D, E, and F as well. That is to think about uh, when you're trying to invent activities that will involve other people to be creative. Okay. And we'll talk about some of those creative ideas. To um, do, and that's sort of like activity, isn't it? But um, explore, find new activities, think outside the box. What's on your uh, bucket list? What's something you've never tried? What's an adventure you'd like to have? And follow your curiosity. If something pops up into your head that sounds like, hmm, I could give that a try, don't dampen it down, scoop it up, give it a try. So concrete ideas, and this is a place where you can unmute yourself and add to the conversation anytime you want to. I'm just going to give you some of the things that I found out about or uh, and looked up and can tell you about. I'm not going to talk about each and every one of them, but they will trigger some ideas for you anyway. So social groups that meet in some kind of regular fashion is the thing I think that we think about first. It's the most obvious of the, of the groups of possible ways to meet new people and put them into our outer or maybe inner circle. Um, we have only women in our audience right this second, but I will tell you anyway that there are groups called the Romeos. Have you ever heard of them? The Romeos are all over the country. They're men, retired old men eating out. They named themselves. I don't like the name, you know, it seems sort of a put down. But they actually meet for lunch or breakfast every week. They become the closest, closest of friends. And we have several Romeo clubs in Greensboro. I don't actually know of a woman's club like that, but I do know that the research shows that women are more likely to form their own groups. Men need a more, typically, not always, of course, typically need a little more structure to get going with it's just a plain social activity. Right here in, um, in Greensboro, we have a number of opportunities that are hours, but they're replicated in other places. So if you uh, live in Georgia and you're watching this, this video, or you live um, in Winston, you know, just a little far out, further out from Greensboro, like Winston-Salem, you can find parallel kinds of organizations. Every, uh, lots and lots of places I have parks and rec organizations of some sort run by, um, by the government. And um, here in Greensboro, the parks and rec centers run educational programs, all kinds of games, and of course, exercise and athletics. And in, during the pandemic, they have continued to have programs on things like running and drum playing. I don't know how they did the running virtually, but they did. Senior Resources of Guilford is a very rich opportunity for the same kinds of things, exercise, education, and all kinds of support. People go to these activities regularly, get to know each other, they form friendships. And Silver Sneakers, YMCA, you can keep adding to this list, can't you? If you wanted to do, to form a social group, but you don't want to get together in someone's home, it's, of course, now it's probably, um, it's perfectly okay. Uh, well, I don't want to make recommendations. I'll tell you that the CDC is saying that outdoor activities are safe, particularly for vaccinated people. Um, and you have to make your own decisions about what the CDC, you know, about how you're going to follow the rules about indoor um, get togethers right now as we are still navigating the pandemic, but it has gotten the CDC has, has uh, indicated that some things are more safe than they would have been a few months ago. But there are virtual ways to have these groups meet too. Um, we're doing that right now. We could have a, a book club on Zoom. 
There's also, uh, there are also many other platforms for virtual meetings like houseparty.com, which is one of the many sites where you can play games and just sit around and talk. I have a house party uh, get together with a particular group of people regularly, same time every week. Doesn't uh, so you can sit in my living room and still stay in contact with some people who um, have really an intimate relationship in, in terms of sharing ideas and feelings. I'm having a little trouble advancing this, so just give me a second. Definitely not. There we go. I really uh, skipped ahead to say this, to say that be sure you're being safe in the way you're having, you're conducting activities right now. Um, but I am amused by some of these outdoor activities. And I'm seeing a lot of people of all ages riding bikes. Um, that's increased enormously. In fact, apparently you can't, it's very hard to, to buy a new car and to buy a bike right now and to buy a piece of wood. They're all, uh, all scarce right now. Oh. There's another kind of social group that is much more directed in the sense that it has a mission uh, that's very specific to a need that somebody has. And there's a support group um, where people get together because they have a common need. Um, the age coach, I'm the age coach, and I do run some of those kinds of groups, but there are many others. Alzheimer's Association clearly is for families who are navigating Alzheimer's. Uh, Alzheimer's disease. There are um, there are support groups for all kinds of chronic or long-term diseases uh, to help people get information, but also to create bonds of that are caring and supportive over a period of time. People who have something a need in common. Again, uh, there are um, support groups through resources, senior resources at Guilford, and information that comes from them too about a common need that people have, a common need, for example, grandparents who are raising grandchildren. And then ACAP, which is a pretty new organization, it's a pretty new organization, but in Greensboro, it's a very new organization. It's the um, adult children of aging parents. Information, but also fellowship and friendships come out of those kinds of meetings. So there's kinds of social activity. Um, another way to get engaged with other people. I mean, you don't want to, you can't stop somebody on the street and say, be my best friend. You want to have a motivator. And one of the motivators is just plain social group, but also a terrific motivator are education and learning opportunities. When you get together with someone um, to learn something and to have conversation, you may very well form friendships. Now, if you go to a class and it's um, just a lecture and there's not opportunity to interact with the teacher, the instructor, or the other students, that's good for your brain. And it's also enjoyable. But it doesn't address the issue of socializing. There has to be interaction, conversation, and the opportunity to perhaps find people who you have something in common with so that you may continue that relationship as you move along. Uh, I know some of you know all about Shepherd Center. Shepherd Center has adventures in learning where they, especially on Zoom, well, no, I'm not gonna say that. I was gonna say, especially on Zoom, it has become very interactive. People talk to each other, they chat before and after class, during the class. But in fact, when they meet face to face, there's even more of that because people come there, uh, talk to each other in class and then they have lunch together 
Um, it's a wonderful way to get to know other people who have some common interest about learning. Here's the Murray Society of UNCG. If you, do you know about Rhodes, Rhodes Scholars? It used to be called Elder Host, Hostel. Hostel. Um, I taught memory improvement classes for them for years. You, if you haven't looked them up, it's worth, it's worth doing that because there's just unbelievable variety of classes, courses, and even travel that they sponsor. And, um, you know, you take a trip with somebody, you sit through a class for a week with somebody, um, there's a good chance you're going to get to know them well. And some other ideas are up here. Senior Center without sen Seniors Center without borders, uh, without walls, is, um, has lots of educational opportunities. They're not always interactive. And master classes are wonderful opportunities to. They are. Uh, they cost something, but they're wonderful opportunities for learning. Again, you want to look for the ones that provide a social opportunity if that's your goal. You know, there are loads and loads of other opportunities right here locally. Um, if you were in Greensboro, and again, these same kinds of activities would exist in other places. For example, um, Green Hill Gallery is local. It has on-site, face-to-face, and right now virtual programming around the arts. The North Carolina Museum of Art has virtual tours as does the Rinalda House. And then there are the ones that are far away that have virtual programming. A lot of it's been increased because of the pandemic. Oh, but, you know, you can do anything from going to, to cooking school to watching the New York Philharmonic or the Philadelphia Orchestra, learn to play the guitar, um, take dance classes, take exercise classes, all online in real time and in many cases get to know other people. Now one other thing you can do is find one person or two people or five people you know who might be interested for example in going to the Philadelphia Orchestra and do it together. So the activity may be far away and virtual but you may be able to enjoy that activity in your living room with other people or using Zoom or house party so that you're all watching the same program at the same time and then can talk about it. If I love um, Beethoven and I watch it with Karen, then Karen and I can talk about what we liked about the performance, what we didn't like about the performance. It gives us something to talk about and to build our, relate, build our friendship. Of course, you can learn things. There's an, no end to what you can learn and the classes you can go to, but you can also teach them. And this um, is something that I, I've been promoting since the pandemic started. You can use a platform like Zoom and talk to somebody who lives in California and show them how to build a bird cage or bake your favorite pie, or speak French, whatever it is, what your skill and knowledge is, you can share with other people. For example, um, I, I bake meringues. They're little fluffy egg, white, egg whites. That when you fluff them up and then you bake them in the oven until they become crisp and there's nothing in them but egg whites and sugar. So as you might imagine, my eight grandchildren think they are the best thing ever invented. But now they, I couldn't see them for 15 months and besides they're pretty grown up. So what I did was I made a video. I sent the video of me baking them to all of the kids and then we wa they watched the video and then we came together on Zoom to bake them to, at the same time. It was socializing, there was a new skill, I was sharing something I knew everybody liked. 
didn't have to be very complicated. Just making a film, all I did was made a film on my, on my iPhone, on my uh, smartphone, sent it out, and then had a Zoom meeting with the kids. So again, if you have something special that you know about that you want to discuss, whether you're discussing anti-racism or you're discussing building a birdhouse, you can do that with other people in a way that bonds you. You're going to have conversations beyond just that birdhouse or that social justice issue. All good for socializing. So I gave you some examples here, baking. Uh, baking something special, cooking something special, building a birdhouse, caring for endangered animals, and so forth. You know, we sometimes minimize the importance of um, the, the socializing part of the going to work. For many people, when they work full time, a great part of their social interactions happen at work. That's where they, you know, they talk about the dog. They talk about what happened um, with their niece. They maybe make plans to go to a movie together. They bond in ways many times in work. And what we know is that older adults and younger adults, that younger adults are working typically in great part are working but even older adults are working. Do you know that the largest increase in the working force is with people who are 55 and older? So lots of folks, even um, mature adults, are continuing to work full-time or part-time or are looking for new full-time or part-time work, partly because there are financial needs sometimes and, so, and sometimes just because it's a way to uh, address or combat, combat being isolated. It's being out in the world with other people with whom you have a common interest. It's perfectly possible to have an encore career, and there are lots of ways to, do, to find those jobs virtually. I've got a couple of examples here. It's also perfectly possible to work virtually. Now, if you're working by yourself, not talking to anybody, you're in your living room by yourself making sales calls, that doesn't fit the social activity part very well. But often, you know, people are working virtually and having Zoom meetings and really connecting. The other side of that is that um, volunteerism is, interestingly enough, it's um, it's just as popular with young people, as middle-aged people, as older adults. People volunteer. The percentage of, the, of people who volunteer in each age group is about the same. It's between 20 and 25 percent of all people volunteer. And the nifty part about volunteering, when I think about it, is uh, number one, you're contributing, okay? And it feels good to contribute. But whether it's your time, your skills, your knowledge, your whatever. But and you have certain freedom when you volunteer. But one of the things that had occurred to me in a conversation we had this morning, it occurred to me that the thing about volunteering is that it gives you a conversation to have that starts a friendship. You know, if you meet somebody, um, I don't know, at church, synagogue, at a concert, it's a little awkward for some of us to just call them up and say, hey, you know, it was sort of interesting. To, I, I enjoyed meeting you, and I, it was interesting. And can we just sit and talk? That seems awkward to some people. But if I'm volunteering, I have a reason to call them. Volunteering means I have a conversation to start with them. I'm going to call them to say, you know, I'm volunteering at, um, at the health center and trying to raise some money and we're selling cookies. And I was wondering if you would like to 
uh, bake a couple of dozen cookies, and it gives you a reason to make that first call, that first contact with somebody. Um, also, during the pandemic, it became increasingly popular to make phone calls to any to people on a particular list. Um, your church or synagogue may have had a list of people who were particularly isolated during the pandemic, and you could take that list and call this folks. It gave you a reason to call them. You were calling to make sure they were okay, that they were having social contact. But at the same time, you were having social contact when you made that call. There are lots and lots of other volunteer opportunities like this. Um, among my favorite these days, are ones about my own personal favorites about intercultural understanding and the Piedmont Interfaith Council and NCCJ are examples of groups who are just getting people together to talk so that they can get to know each other so that people get along better. They have not got a big politi a political agenda at all. It's just reaching out to make friendships across differences. Um, for some people, for many people, it's also important to remember, for everybody, it's important to remember that intimacy is part of this whole social activity. I'm not talking about physical intimacy necessarily. I'm talking about sharing feelings, thoughts, caring, being committed to another person, having mutual interests, knowing of each other's histories. And you may be able to think of whether it's a partner or it's a friend, you may be able to think about those relationships you have that are really committed and sharing uh, and mutual in, in their caring. There's an interesting study that was done, that is still being done at Harvard. The study is 75 or I think this is probably closer to 80 years now um, the, at Harvard. And the um, original study was um, included subjects were all freshmen at Harvard or young people, young men who were living close by but were not in college and were poor. And they, these people have been followed since the study began 75 or 80 years ago to find out who lived the longest, who was the healthiest, and who was the happiest. The study has shown over all these years that the healthiest, happiest, and longest living people were people who were in good, care, mutually caring relationships. That means not necessarily married to each other, but in relationships that were bonded and active, using that ABC um, example I, I gave you earlier. Well, the activities, the ideas go on and on. You could be an advocate, and certainly we just came out of a, of a political advocacy time, and we're going right back into it. The mid-year elections will be up. If that's interesting to you, that's the way you can advocate. I'm a member of AARP, and they're always looking for people who will advocate for issues that are important to older adults. And we can go, um, go on and on there. Just, you know, you can be in love with cats and dogs, and and be um, an advocate for humane treatment of animals. Book groups are a great way to get together on a regular basis and have something in particular to talk about. You know, that conversation starter I was mentioning when I was talking about volunteering. Forming a book group means you all are doing something together. You have a focus that starts the conversation, even if after 15 minutes of talking about the book, you're talking about gardening or traveling to um, the Adirondacks or whatever. It starts the conversation, it starts the friendship. For lots of us, family meetings may be the way um, that we socialize. Um, and I mentioned that houseparty.com has games on it, but there are tons of ways to play games with other people. Again, it's a conversation start, and if you do it on a regular basis, it means there's a, there's a, a common interest and time to socialize aside from the game. 
and the one in R. So they were just some of my ideas. What will you do next? Will it be a social activity? Support? Education course or workshop? Some kind of work or volunteer activity? I highly recommend that um, you think about, you stretch, you follow your curiosity. What is something I'd really like to try that I'm not quite pushing myself to do? And then pick one thing you can do to move towards that. Don't try to make a whole big plan. One thing, one person who would be interested in the book group would like to discuss getting starting it, for example. Make a plan, identify what you need to carry out that plan, figure out how you'll find people. You know, will it be um, at a church group where you can get the idea or through your synagogue bulletin or through, um, a, social, through a community center, through the library where you will figure out how to get in touch with people and how to get the resources you need to get something off the ground. Always share what you're planning to do, partly because that gets you more people, but mostly because once you make it public, it's a thing that you're likely to carry out. It really is true. And most importantly, enjoy what you're doing and congratulate yourself for having thought up uh, and started a new plan for yet another social activity. So I know that's a lot of information and maybe not exactly the idea that you have been thinking about, but let's stop the recording now and let's just chat with each other for just a couple of minutes about the kinds of things we've talked about.